I think we can officially start this talk after many te technical difficulties. My computer also started to update exactly in the moment when I called in. And then it said I will restart after the update is finished. So I had to switch to computers. So Sonia, you are not the only one. Um, uh -oh. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. My name is Mikhail Seputovic. I'm the curator um, and CEO of Terma Art, that is part of the Terma Group. Um, and I want to thank uh, especially my co-moderator, Emma Dexter, and everybody from the British Council, and also our media partner, Design, for making this talk possible. We have already a history of uh, collaboration with the British Council. The last talk we held together in Venice, it was under the title, The Right to Refuse, uh, in the exhibition of Kathy Wilkes. It was in November last year, and it seems to be already uh, centuries away uh, from our time today. I remember we were standing together and, uh, until our knees uh, in the water on the St. Marcos Square. And I was thinking now it really starts with biblical, basically, plagues. Uh, we have a flooding. Before we had the Amazonian rainforest burning. We already forgot a little bit about this. And um, in between, we had a plague. And now also we have a current situation of international protests and social unrest. So. Um, I think this is the framework uh, of our talk. Um, uh, we, uh, this talk is part of a series that we started during COVID-19 called Wellbeing Culture, because we somehow uh, saw that uh, culture is an integral, uh, integral element of um, uh, asking the right questions in the wake of the situation. Culture, we incorporated in our company in 2017 with founding the art program in Terma Art actually also in Britain, in the Royal Institution in Britain, as a part of the, or in, in parallel to the Art and Architecture Conference of Greece. And uh, since um, two years, we are co cooperating with the British Council, um, looking into uh, questions that become more and more relevant. So well-being, when we started this program, was something nice to have. Now we learned that if we are not well, we are probably already getting sick. Probably we are already uh, uh, going into um, a state that, uh, that that we don't want to be in. Um, we had two talks already um, uh, during the series. Uh, the first one was uh, together with the Serpentine Gallery about art and architecture and how art uh, can basically change architecture into the better. And uh, the second talk was last Wednesday about life culture together with the Manchester International Festival um, and with Mark Spiegler from Art Basel about uh, the question how festival can become um, maybe a kind of layout for cities and how we can learn from an anti-culture actually or an culture outside the cities uh, to be implemented in, uh, in our daily life. And... Um, I want to quote Tokwasa Dyson um, uh, that uh, on the 27th of May uh, said that for her, for her artistic uh, practice, uh, um, this was only, uh, uh, it was actually in the wake of, of, of the murder of George Floyd uh, in Minneapolis. She said that uh, how this could happen out of a state system in an urban environment in a moment of distancing. And she quoted, uh, she connected architecture, uh, the systems of architecture of cities, geographies, and state policies, uh, and connected basically the, the picture of the pavement and uh, the body and the police car and everything together. That this all is like one element that we need to look into and that is probably um, deeply connected. Um, I, I also would say it's connected with the flooding and it's connected with uh, with different elements that in the first uh, moment seems to be uh, not connected. And I'm extremely happy that everybody here uh, on this panel is basically showed with uh, his or her practice that uh, this kind of deep understanding of the connectivity of things um, is represented here. And I'm extremely grateful that that, that you can join this talk that will be uh, focusing um, on uh, the relevant question how social systems are constructed through architecture and city planning and how they can help uh, also to 
be um, uh, made better and uh, adapt uh, uh, through architecture and city planning. And yeah, now I would like to um, ask Emma Dexter to, to uh, and thank you again, Emma, and uh, to introduce the panelists um, yeah. that you have chosen to, to participate in this talk. And I'm very much looking forward to talk with you all. About. Thank you. Thank you, Mikolai. Um, I, first of all, I want to say a big thank you uh, to you, Mikolai, and to <coughs> MA Art for hosting these Wellbeing Culture Forum talks and giving us the space for this essential dialogue um, about the current moment that we're in. Um, and also, really importantly, for your interest in going support for um, the British Pavilion <coughs> in Venice, which is also um, something that, that really gives us a, a huge amount of hope for the future. Um, in a moment, I'm going to introduce the panel to you, but before I do that, I just wanted to say a few words of introduction um, and show you a few images um, just to set the scene from my perspective um, at, at the British Council um, and also in my role as Commissioner of the British Pavilion for the Venice Art Biennale. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, hang on a minute, sorry. I, <laughs> I hope you'll, uh, are you able to share it? Yes, I am, sorry. I, it was all ready before and now it seems to have uh, vanished. Um, I mean, all these technical difficulties, we really have to match with the fact that we don't have to fly to the talk, that we don't have to, you know, have all this burden that we would usually have. And actually, if you compare it, as, uh, it doesn't matter what happens to our computers, it's still less than to, uh, so it's, it's such a, you know, amazing possibility that we also learned now at uh, our company, how efficient it can be to connect, like, um, without the need to, but sometimes to rely on computers is also a problem. Sorry, sorry about this. Um, it was already in the, it was all perfect in the rehearsal that we did earlier. Um, here it is. So it's just loading now. And okay. Can you can you see my screen? No. No, okay. <laughs> Maybe during you try uh, to show the images, I can say some more words about uh, the Wellbeing Culture Forum, and I will stop immediately. Uh, no, I got it now. Perfect. Sorry. Ah, super. Kathy Wilkes. Wow. Couple of slides. So yes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There so, is still, there's still a message that you can, I think, click away. This blue one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No yes, I've not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Um, so many memories connected with these pictures. Here we are. So um, I think the, the first question that you want to address, Mikolai, is um, the whole question of um, um, Venice and um, what is what what's happening there now, but also in a sense what it represents and, and, and what it represents as a city and what it represents as a space that can be, if you like, taken over. So um, um, 
The first slide, of course, is Phila Dibalo, um, Folly from 2017. Um, just a reminder of, of what the building looks like. Um, and then the next slide um, is from Ireland, uh, in the Architecture Biennale um, that was um, curated by Caruso St. John in collaboration with the artist Marcus Taylor. Um, sorry, for some reason it keeps going on. I must have clicked something. Um, and I think it really links very neatly um, that particular manifestation to today's topic for discussion because they very specifically created a public space on the roof that was um, for socializing um, and also for contemplation, contemplation of nature, again, something that we all touch on today, um, but then left the interior of the building completely empty and used it as a space for collaboration with other artists. So Kate Tempest came and did a performance, for example. And so it was a space for collaboration and um, discussion. Um, so again, I think that those, uh, you know, interestingly, um, that particular project really um, signals sort of, uh, I think, the, the way that those pavilions can be used um, as kind of provocations structural provocations um, in a city. Um, then the next slides, just reminding you, because for, this was important for, for, for us as a, as a project, because um, this was the first time that Terme became in, Terme, Art Terme became involved in um, um, the Art Biennale. Um, and we had a wonderful collaboration around Kathy Wilkes's um, exhibition. Um, which again, very much looked at um, marginalized um, human beings, um, abused children, um, and, and really the overlooked and the ignored. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to um, give um, a little puff to Sonia Boyce, who we are so delighted um, has accepted our commission of representing the UK at the um, Art Biennale of 2022, um, and of course Elvira, who's on the um, on the discussion, um, was one of our um, committee members who helped to choose Sonia. And I think um, her work has been chosen for many reasons, but very much because of the role that collaboration and dialogue um, play with, particularly with other artists. Um, and the sort of very participatory nature of her work. So um, again, I think that's incredibly germane to the discussion that we're going to have today. So this is an image from um, a moving image work called Exquisite Cacophony um, from 2015. Um, this is a work from 2018 called Devotional. Um, so that's a, a fragment view um, and then um, finally, the show that um, Gavin Wade, who's also one of our panelists, currently has um, up in Birmingham at the moment, a Deeside Projects under lockdown, I assume still, um, her exhibition um, in the castle of my skin. Um, and then finally, um, just a reminder um, that next year's Architecture Biennale is going to examine um, with a slightly different focus, but, but really very much the same, covering similar ground to what we might look at this afternoon. Um, the Garden of Privatized Delights, um, Unseen Architecture, which is curated by Manager Vergese and Madeleine Kessler, um, looks at the debate around public space, particularly from a UK perspective. Um, so looking at everything from the use of the pub to the playground, to common land, to squares, high streets, um, and surveillance technology, etc. cetera. Um, so they, together with um, many other architects and researchers, um, are addressing these key questions about the nature of public space and are trying to propose new ideas for ownership and access um, to demonstrate the role that design and architecture can play in a more inclusive future. Um, and uh, that's now back to the um, back to the panel. So I will very quickly, uh, if that's okay with everybody, introduce our panelists. Uh, so first of all, um, 
I will now stop sharing. Um, Sonia Boyce, um, who is representing the UK um, at the Art Biennale in 2022. Um, Sonia has had major exhibitions recently at Manchester Art Gallery and London's ICA, and she also appeared in Ocarin Wessel's um, 56th International Art Exhibition um, in 2015 in Venice. And as I said, her current exhibition in the Castle of My Skin um, is currently on at Eastside Projects. Um, she is also a professor um, at the University of Arts London, where she holds the inaugural chair in Black Art and Design. Our next panelist is Elvira Dianagi uh, Oze. Um, Elvira is affiliated to the Department of Visual Cultures at Goldsmiths and the Thought Council at the Fondazione Prada. She previously worked at Creative Time um, as senior curator in New York, has also curated the Gothenburg International Contemporary Biennale and worked both at Tate Modern um, and is now the director of the Showroom Gallery in London. Um, her practice has a particular focus on multidisciplinarity um, and very much focuses on the everyday and artistic interventions in public space and, and the public sphere and looks at looks for overlooked non-Western narratives and epistemologies. Um, our next um, panelist is David Kahn, who's director of David Kahn Architects Limited. Um, he's an architect and educator whose practice is particularly involved with the social life of cities and uh, is again very much in, um, indebted to an idea of working collaboratively. Um, he's working on a big new project for market halls in the center of Birmingham in collaboration with Eastside Projects. Um, and he might perhaps be best known to a lot of people, certainly um, for a UK audience, for um, the work that he collaborated on with Fiona Banner, um, the artist called A Room for London, um, which was a space on the South Bank that sort of overlooked and commanded a very particular view and position. Um, and I hope he'll, he'll tell us a bit more about that. He also teaches at the Architectural Association. Um, Cida Lewison um, is our next panelist. Um, he's an artist, writer and curator based in London. Um, he's worked on many exhibition projects and in many institutions in the UK, such as Tate Britain, Tate Modern, um, and also worked with the British Council. He's published widely on street art um, and um, has made many, he's also a practicing artist and has made many of his own books. Um, he's recently started working at the South Bank Centre as a curator, and he's also finishing off a project, um, Dub London, uh, which is due to open late in 2020 at um, the Museum of London. So welcome, Cedar. Um, next, uh, Gavin Wade uh, is an artist um, and curator, director of Eastside Projects. He's also a senior research fellow at Birmingham City University, and he co-curated um, Sonia's exhibition in the Castle of My Skin um, and numerous other exhibitions. And he's got a very wide range of experience of making art in public, everything from Twitter to naval frigates to cathedrals and parks. Um, and um, yeah, he's also published widely. Susie Wilson, um, last but not least, um, is artistic director of Claude Ensemble, and Susie um, is, has really created a very special, uh, which, which defies categorization, a very special form of movement-based performance work, um, which um, has garnered a huge amount of attention and praise. Um, the work has been presented in the Turbine Hall at Tate Modern, um, as well as dissected Sadler's Wells, its auditorium, its stage, its structure. Um, and I think she's always keen to be working with space in her practice um, and really interrogating what space is and what it means. Um, and she's also really pioneered um, work in which um, talking about movement, choreography, nonverbal and spatial, 
elements um, are brought into uh, working with healthcare workers. Um, so she also enjoys a position as an honorary professor at Barts and London School of Medicine and Dentistry. So um, again, bringing in the dimension, I think, of health and well-being um, as a really important consideration, a much overlooked consideration, I think, when we're obviously looking at, at, at many modern cities on a global scale. So, um, Mikolai, that, that's our panel. Um, I was wondering, would you like to ask the first question because you have a very particular take on Venice, the Venice Biennale, so we could kick off with that and then move on to some other related topics. Is that thank okay? Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. I mean, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, you don't need to introduce anybody to me uh, because I already, I'm uh, under, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm impressed about uh, your all practice that is extremely interdisciplinary and uh, diverse in many sense. And I think this is actually something that is extremely missing in our regular life. And somehow we, 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 we talked beforehand uh, about this, that um, most of social life actually is happening outside of art, obviously, because art is a context that is uh, quite exclusive. Uh, and it created a extremely important space for freedom, for expression, also for critique, um, that we cannot find somehow in the you know, daily life of our, of our uh, society. Um, and the, the, the simple question, because our, our forum uh, is examining the, the, the question, how a better a society, how a better city, because we are all now living in cities and we are all moving into cities and cities will become, uh, they are already the predominant place of human populations to organize with each other, to live with each other, um, but they will be even more so. And uh, somehow when we look at cities, it seems that they took a historical development and they arrived somewhere where it's simply unhealthy. So, you know, there, there is a reason that COVID-19 is spreading so fast to big cities like New York. Um, and the question is uh, also regarding our life quality, also regarding justice, uh, you know, also regarding um, many of the topics that you all worked with. And when we looked at Venice and we looked at the Venice Biennale, we're looking basically at historical buildings that are recontextualized and uh, and put it into a new um, a narrative every single year. But this is not happening in our inner cities. In our inner cities, this historical buildings, memorials, and the history is basically built in stone and it stays like that and is untouched because, uh, because it belongs to banks, it belongs to, you know, uh, to a different kind of value system. The question is, can't we, uh, uh, learn from Venice and implement what we are celebrating every year in in Venice in all of our cities. Can we put more of this art artistic practice into into our daily life, not as an exception, but as a you know regularity? And um, yeah, I would completely open. Uh, so whoever likes to start uh, um, to build this bridge, I would be. I mean, I will. Elvira. Elvira, you look like you're ready. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I am, but I just want to say that uh, that somehow I, I feel like I have a slightly different view of, of your approach to Venice, uh, Nicola, because um, of course it is a space of like full of vibrancy, but that vibrancy um, represents also some uh, stress or distress for the local population at times, right? Uh, and it live together with other forms of engagement that are that are typical of any city and particularly of a historical city that have much more to offer, not just the art that is the art or the cinema or the architecture or the reflection of all these fields uh, there. But also there is something very special about Venice that is that the area where the Biennale sit is also an area that was conceived to represent certain powers, 
and 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 of course the, the sort of like the layout of the of Venice is um, we we almost have in a way in the in fact I think the mimic of of every city right with sort of like technocratic powers are there uh, to stay systematic structures are there to stay are also represented in the way that we not only experience the event but also visit every year the pavilion so there are the classical pavilions that we can see in the Giardini and then Arsenale, and then all these other countries that somehow fight to be part of that real state that is now that, that arena no? that has been really um, created as a platform for exchange, no? visibility, etc. So I think like both what you were presenting, but also the, the other side of it, which is how so much of the powers of the city, the voices of the local community, but also all these other countries that historically have had no representation or no building, right? To represent their practice, also get into the larger debate. No? And I feel like um, the most successful Vainia have been the ones that have created a dialogue between those inside both Giardini Arsenale and those spread throughout the city. And at the same time, um, what is beautiful about that moment in Venice is the fact that we can go across the city to see this, this uh, and engage with all the tourist uh, elements that, that characterize that uh, beautiful city, but also, uh, you know, people protest, uh, no, that the eyes is, is, is often frequent uh, during that time. So I feel like, there is, there is, I mean, a little bit of both. Uh, we somehow bring to to our our territories, to our cities nowadays. Sonia, would you like to? Yeah, um, I, I suppose I would go in a very, I, I'd go in a slightly more localized direction uh, in terms of, you know, I suppose I'm wanting to think about the last few months of lockdown, and the whole question of being local. Um, and for me, what has been really very interesting just on my street and in my mm -hmm. neighborhood is one getting to know my neighbors who I didn't, you know, I, I don't know that I had seen hardly any of them. There's about two or three families that I've known on the street. And suddenly out of this crisis, the street pulled together uh, in a way which in, in, a, in a kind of very contrary way in that we were distant, but next to each other. And people were, you know, people have been uh, swapping things and we've been having, a, there's a kind of Facebook page for our street. And I found that really very interesting that in this moment of crisis where we have to stay apart, we found another way to connect and connect with, with those who are strangers next door to each other. Mm. So that's, that's one thing. And then... Uh, the other thing that uh, has been interesting, uh, and it kind of connects a little bit with what Elvira and Mikolai uh, have been saying, is um, having to rediscover the neighbourhood. You know, finding, so you know, one couldn't get certain items because they'd sold out in a particular place, and finding um, stores that you have walked past all the time, or uh, finding that there are small traders who are selling from their homes, and there's there's one there's one uh, just up the road from me who who has chickens and was selling fresh eggs to everybody and 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 through a very uh, localized network there was a for me a kind of uh, there's been a kind of remapping of my very locality that mm -hmm. I was not aware of or had just ignored um, and somehow it's this crisis that has revealed that. Um, and of course, I've, uh, you know, thinking about somewhere like Venice and as we all do when we go there, we, we find ourselves often very lost in a corner that we, we didn't quite know about. And I do wonder what it's like actually for those who are resident there to cons constantly have to consume all these other people that come in and go out mm -hmm. while it, for them, it's still mm -hmm. their locality. Um, I have no answer to this question, but I think I think the recent uh, recent events have thrown up some of those questions. Mm. I think um, I mean I heard um, uh, I heard Fran Francis Morris talking on the radio last night about um, 
take modern and 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 the sort of need to rethink and um you know i think large institutions are now thinking how can they i mean the, you know they they've all most institutions aspire to connect with community but i think probably this this is going to have to require a, a much more fundamental change um, in, in terms of a relationship with locality um, and, and thinking very differently about who your audience is. Um, sorry, um, um, yeah, do please put your finger up, um, your hand up, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> if you want to talk. David. Well, I just going to say something um, following Avira and Sonia's comments to Michelai's question about Venice. Um, I think what's what's interesting is you know we're at this moment where we're going to emerge from our homes and go into a city which probably for many people is a bit daunting what what are the rules what can we do what can't we do where can we go how do we meet other people um and i think that that in, impacts two types of space there's the public the public realm which presumably now is going to become much more um closely connected to private interests around to restaurants on streets, et cetera. Um, but there's also all of the, the interior spaces that surround the public realm. And I think this question of a, a city that is cut, like suddenly emptied, I mean, I think there are all sorts of spaces that, I mean, I remember 10 years ago in outer London, we were given commissions to try and revitalize high streets where shops had left and boroughs were trying to understand how to bring people back in. And the idea was, well, if we make those spaces, spaces for events, we'll come for the events. And then the, the consequence for the, the retail space around will be they're the secondary interest point. So it became a kind of question of almost reinventing public space, not as a, a, a space of crossing between shops, but actually a venue in its own right with a value that local people understand. And I wonder whether that is going to become much more common in the centre of cities. There's going to be a kind of emptiness in some parts where, I mean, I thought it was interesting you know, thinking about Birmingham. We've just done a year's worth of research at the Architecture Association about bits of Birmingham and then the high streets emptying and the largest Primark in the world having departed. I mean, there's these huge spaces um, which... Mm. It, it has a, a strange echo of festival cities where kind of density um, event will be much more cyclical or we're certainly going to see a quite different types of activity. I think that should be, I mean, it's, so the, the anxiety of going back into the city is also a moment to perhaps really enjoy what possibilities are, are there and also Going back to the point that Sonia was making, like who who's invited, who who gets to take part? Cedar. Um, like to. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a complex question in a sense because Venice is so complicated. Really, um, it's just it's hard to know where to start with Venice. I mean, I love I love I love Venice in a lot of what you know. I really love visiting, um, and it's it's a it's a kind of miracle at a play, but it's, it's very complex. You know, think about Venice in terms of its place in the birth of capitalism and the, complex, uh, the complexities of um, just being in Venice. I mean, if, if you ask what could we learn from the Venice biennial or, or Venice as a location, it's quite tricky because it's, it's, such a, it's such a kind of luxurious place. And it's not, so basically not everybody gets to go there. It's a very, you know, it's a real luxury to get to go to Venice, which, you know, we're, we're all lucky to take part in. So I don't really feel that's something we need to learn from I think you know it's not Venice is not in my, in my opinion for the people uh it's a very exclusive you know think of the yachts at Venice and the, the fact how much it's even just getting into the Biennale I usually manage to blag in somehow but it's it's quite expensive to enter it the, just to get into the Biennale it's quite expensive and then and then when, when you walk around the city you're always struck by the there are people selling bags and people who who don't benefit or you know the migrants mm. there and so forth so it's a very split city uh, and, and as I say, it's fantastic, and I love the history, and I love visiting the historic museums, and I love looking at the art. But it's very split, like all cities, obviously. Like you know, there's no city that isn't like that. But um, 
I don't necessarily feel, <laughs> I don't necessarily feel that's something to learn from. Uh, I think in a sense, it, I, I think they should make Venice more for the people somehow. Um, and if anything, it, we, we need to be able to bring that spirit of, of excellence, of bringing the best art in the world or the best architecture to each of our cities. So we should, we'll, you know, so everybody should be able to participate in that, however that is. And obviously there's a there's big, bigger and more questions about how travel, et cetera, is gonna change after COVID. But I think in a sense, it's really how can we bring this excellence to the world would be my thing. I mean, I think it, you've raised some really interesting points, Cedar, because um, what you're talking about is beauty, um, but you're also talking about a city that doesn't have cars which contributes to its beauty and the fact that it has a human dimension. And I think, you know, I think many of us hope that, you know, discussions that are happening about much more cycling, et cetera, um, in future for a variety of reasons, <laughs> um, not forgetting climate change, um, that, that that right to beauty um, for everybody um, is so important. And when do we, when do we talk about it? Um, Susie, would you like to come in? Oh, you're on mute. There you go, can you hear me? Um, I was thinking about how um, buildings the kind of idea of repurposing and recontextualizing buildings. And I suppose in my work, I'm interested, I have been interested in how buildings are regulated and or how they regulate people. So that's very different in a healthcare setting like a hospital um, to an art venue, but there's both, both have very strong kind of histories and, and conventions. So I'm interested in what happens through performance when you begin to stir that up a bit. So for example, having a drama class or a dance class in a medical school or doing a performance of women knitting outside the houses of parliament or bringing an owl into a shopping center. So how can the way we use these buildings help to create a really powerful dialogue and understanding between very different sectors and I think for me this is what this pan pandemic has kind of pointed towards an opportunity where there can be greater bonds forged between people workers often who are kind of stuck in very different types of buildings and how can we like occupy those spaces differently so there are examples in London of arts organizations working in healthcare centers of health um, groups, you know, that are um, focused around particularly mental health, but um, all sorts of different um, health needs being situated in cultural institutions. So where culture is placed in terms of kind of health and well-being, I think is that this is a really interesting moment. And, and the more we can kind of move between buildings, get out of buildings and create connections between buildings across the city, feels like the more understanding um, and kind of shared language will develop, which it seems to me is what is, what is really needed right now. Gavin. I think, yeah, I mean, I'll echo a lot of it. Probably just say that, be a bit more direct and say that what you would learn from Venice is what not to become. And you don't, you know, you, you don't want to be, you don't want to be forced into a position where you rely on tourism. And so the, from my perspective, the Biennale has to rethink what its format is. It can't remain the same. Why do I need to go? You know, during, during lockdown, I was writing the hundred verse poem with 19 people around the UK and around the world on Twitter. And li you know, a line popped out about maybe I'll never go to Venice ever again. And is that, is that so bad? Is that is that the end of needing to travel around the world in that way? So I think the challenge is on the curators and the artists within the Biennale to establish what is its purpose? What does it do for Venice and what does it do for its people? Because it, it is such an extreme concentration of wealth and it has been for such a long time that no city should aspire to be like it, magical and special as it is. If any city aspires to be like Venice, then they're just destined to be 
a horrendous future for humanity. So I just think we should be doing exactly the opposite of what has happened in Venice. And I hope that Venice will also think about how to do that as well. I mean, I, 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 I just, have, just, yeah. to, just to follow up, and I mean, I, I, I tend to agree on that, but I think in a way, when I was last in Venice, I, you start, Venice in itself is a, it's a kind of, the whole place in a sense is a museum. When, you, when as soon as you get off the plane and enter Venice and you have to pay the extra tourist fee or whatever, it feels mm -hmm. as if the whole of Venice is in fact a museum in a sense. Mm -hmm. That's how I was thinking of it in a way when I was last there. Anyway, I just wanted to add that. But, but I think even that is like, it's the wrong sort of museum. It's a museum based on the establishment and the power of wealth to maintain itself at any cost, any cost, regardless of any other social benefits, just at the cost of being the most you know, extreme center of wealth in the world. So it, it, interesting. it's a bad, bad model. I mean, I find it very really interesting because if you look back in times, it was actually started by poor artists to support the local art community. Yeah? So the Venice Biennale was actually an art fair, like Art Basel, just for the Italian artists to exhibit their art. And only within 100 years, it became structurally something completely different. And this shows us how easy it is to restructure something that seems to be written in stone, but actually is only on a very thin uh, paper actually of history. And what I also found super interesting is that the criticism that I absolutely share uh, is still saying that we should bring Venice uh, everywhere. Yeah, we should bring what we want to achieve in Venice uh, to our own city centers. This was a little bit the, the, the starting point of the question because um, this kind of creativity and resources and um, imagination that we allow in Venice to happen because of the resources that we can attribute to it is actually happening in Venice. Instead, it could happen and then we wouldn't need to go to Venice. That's very true um, uh, in our neighborhoods. And this is just one, one last uh, point. What everybody was connecting to the locality. So Sonia said about the remapping locality. And I think it's so, this is why it's also interesting to go back to the roots of Venice that were local. So Venice became so incredibly successful because it started as a local initiative. And uh, this locality is something that has to do with participation. So if you, if you basically go out of the street and you understand your you know, direct environment and you know your neighbors and you know the products that you buy, probably where they are produced and how and what is behind this uh, box, then it's something that allows you to, to own it. And this ownership is exactly, Gavin, what you criticized, that it's uh, the wrong ownership in Venice. But yes, please. Yeah, I, I just, I just want to strongly uh, <laughs> oppose your idea that uh, more art happens in Venice than in my living room or on, my, on the street or in the park. <laughs> or, you know, every one of our living rooms that we're looking at here, even the, the white empty spaces, come from things that we have learned from art. They're about exhibition, they're about ways of making things, creating spaces around us. Art is, is the thing that is everywhere. When the Venice model is the thing that makes it seem like it's, it's only in very particular places. It tries to create a lie and an illusion that this is where art is, but it, it is everywhere. It is when we draw our curtains, it is the way you have positioned the plant in your room, that comes from art. But I also I think it's, like, it's important to remember that there is a Venice outside of the major events, right? And also, like, I don't know if you had done that. I mean, I had the luxury of visiting Venice outside of the time of the biennial. I don't know how many of you had done that. No? Particularly, like, for instance, Sonia, you're going to be encountering a different city every time you go in sort of like in crescendo towards the, the final presentation. But that there is, there is something to be said about, as you were saying, Nicolai, about the... The, 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 the groups that are also creating a sense of how everyday life has a, a sense of purpose in the city and affect the, let's say, the, the, the artistic milieu of the city, but also everyday life that occurs while the, the biennial is, is happening. I mean, I, I will encourage you to walk against, you know, like in the in direction, again, opposite to the biennial uh, venues, because then you encounter the real venues that are also, you know, like um, buildings for uh, low income uh, inhabitants of the city, right? There are many aspects that we tend to forget. There are other areas, other islands, right? Like I feel like that it, we have a narrow view of that through the event. And also I think that the question of, of 
you, Nicolai and, and Gavin are, are considering is about changing the model of the biennial altogether, right? And I, when I have had the opportunity to work with the idea of the biennial in mind, I had never been framed by it. It is about, you know, as you were saying, expanding what already happened in the, in the local, uh, understanding the context, almost like putting a light in the way that you were um, a spotlight in that moment, but is the city is already there, the artists in the city are there. And, and what we should try to do is to create a dialogue with the international artists that come, with expert and cultural agents that arrive, but with the local institutions. And at times I think the off pennies does that beautifully, or Dakar, for instance, right? Like of, of biennial in Dakar does that beautifully, right? Like people make an effort because they know the attention is drawn towards that moment. But what is interesting is that the people that then collaborate with local organizations, those collaborations continue once the, the light of the biennials are off. And this is what I'm interested on, really. This, this is the sort of like the, what I will bring to any other place, which is this investment on hyperlocalism, no? To understand, understanding the street and how that street can, com, can transform uh, into something that is real communal, right? That really in, engage in communal. Yeah, I think this, I think this debate, we, I think we've often used the word Venice to mean the Biennale event and everything that that brings with it. And then of course the city is, is, is another entity. And I, you know, and, and I mean, obviously I think perhaps Mikolai's initial question was, was, was about, about both of those and the sort of intersection of those. But um, I think what you're saying, Elvira, is really important that, um, that, it rethinking how um, the community that actually lives and works in Venice um, is able to own its own space as well. And that's that's I think I think that's um, a key question that I wanted to to look at. Really, was um, how do we um, how do we achieve more agency really as citizens um, within our cities um, that, that they can feel more as if they belong to us, that they represent, um, that the centers particularly represent something much more important. I wanted to, um, I wanted to, uh, I've, I've stolen the idea of um, Elvira, who I know admires Henri Lefebvre, the French philosopher. Um, I was gonna read a very quick quote from him. Um, change life, change society. These ideas completely lose their meaning without producing an appropriate space. New social relations demand a new space and vice versa. Um, so uh, I was thinking, how, how are the structures that we inherit from the past within cities, how do they define our social behavior? Um, and how can we kind of escape from that? Do, how do they delimit um, people's behavior? Because we inherit buildings, we inherit public spaces, we inherit museums from the past. We inherit a certain style of architecture um, in city centers, how, how does that, how do those structures actually inform our behavior um, and how we think about ourselves um, and our society? Um, I was thinking that Gavin might have some initial thoughts on that because that's kind of a, a lot of, I think, of what you think about perhaps. I think so. I mean, for me, one of the, and, and what's happened over the last few weeks with the examination of symbols and artworks in the public as, as much as buildings and um, rules or, the, you know, owners, landowners, things like that, it is to just to not treat this, not treat cities and not treat environments and streets and buildings as if, as if they're neutral. 
And for me, that was that was part of when, when we when we established East Side Projects. I, what I was interested in was just trying never to, to create something that was neutral and to make it so that if we build a wall or we keep the floor a certain way, it's, it's for a reason and it's been made by somebody and it yeah. carries that history with it. And I think that's that's what underpins this idea of how you look at a city. You can see it as just a set of assets or you can see it as a set of social histories. You can, you know, you can see it as a set of codes that you can connect with and 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 change you know and that and i think in a way it's about how the, a city opens itself up to be questioned and to change over time and you know in, in a way again why art is is everywhere around us and so useful is because the way that we experience and look at it changes what the art is so one week we won't even notice a statue and, we, and it won't be functioning, it won't really be exhibiting, it won't really be acting as art, but at a certain moment we begin to see it and we see it as art and we, we can use that, we can agree with, with the principles on how the artwork was built or we can use the artwork in our minds to judge things around it. So you may not always wanna rip down an artwork that comes from a racist history because you might want, want that artwork to judge its surrounding buildings and the people who own the land on it. So sometimes clearing it away may be the, the opposite of that. So I think it's this not it's this transparency that is really important in that. Donya. I'm going to interject there because I, I suppose one of the things that I thought about before our panel discussion began was this question about so-called public art as we understand it and uh, the, the question of the public and the, the question of how people re, uh, relate to it and I'm particularly thinking about of course the the, the pulling down of these uh, these monuments these statues um, and the way in which the 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 impulse and the movement of people to do that has been about uh, insisting on non-sanctioned actions. You know, there was a question here about agency and who has agency. And I think that um, we, we can't be having this conversation actually without that somewhere sitting in the room is that there's been a, a, a movement, not just in the UK, but across the world, mm -hmm. which is, 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 is insisting on um, a, a different kind of agency that isn't about being uh, that isn't sanctioned. What do we do with the non-sanctioned? Particularly <laughs> when uh, public art and publicly commissioned art uh, is coming from a place of sanction and power. Hmm. How do we think about that? Um, now, you know, I'm not trying to talk myself out of a job or any of that outside of, <laughs> outside of because you know, I'm sure we all receive money from uh, you know, kind of public funds as well as um, private funds, but there there is a there is a power question here. There is a question of authority, and the idea that you can tear something like a, a public statue down. And many have been working on these things for many many years, but that it actually happened mm. was a was actually a shock to the system, mm. to my system, not just to the world system, but to my system. So, you know, do you think that, um, yeah, this question about who, who, who is who is sanctioned and what is sanctioned is kind of a question here. Mm. I, I, I totally think that this is also a health uh, topic, uh, actually, uh, because it's a topic of ownership. Mm. Uh, we, if, if we don't, you know, allow these things to happen, so to have uh, every generation to have its own relationship to the memorials, for example, of the past, to the buildings of the past, also to deconstruct them, then we live in a world of total social alienation. And actually for us, this is quite relevant because our company uh, received the building permit to build a big uh, facility of ours in Manchester. And Manchester is somehow the starting point of you know, people moving from outside uh, of the cities, from the countryside into the cities, completely restructuring family life, not living anymore with animals on farms and big, you know, social communities of families, but uh, everything becomes rationalized and everything becomes more abstract. And now the world that we are living in today 
is already so abstract that it's very difficult for especially young people to claim ownership about this world. So they, they go out, you know, they leave their PlayStation, they go out on the street and the street is, is not something that they can just uh, own. And I, I think this is also to Zuzi um, a question that I would love to um, pass uh, to you. If, um, if the connectivity between the building environment, the social system, and uh, the healthcare um, of a community, of a population, um, is something that uh, you think can be... Um, I don't want to go back to Venice because I also don't... Just, <laughs> so basically, Venice is kind of a symbol, but because we have all these resources and because it's considered to be the most important whatsoever, we allow something to happen that we don't allow to happen in our cities. This is what I believe, although I'm totally agreeing with you, Gavin, that uh, that it should uh, happen and it's actually happening, but without resources and very often totally restricted and uh, and basically penalized. Yes, so, um, yeah, and set I up. think, um, <coughs> Mikolai, could, I think Cedar wants to come in quickly and then if we can move to Susie, if that's okay. Yeah, okay, so I also, um, yeah, I think it's really important to to, to raise the, the statues coming down. Um, I think it's, and and the, as Sonia says, the idea of um, sanctioned thing, things being sanctioned in public space. But I, I, and I'd like to come back to it. We'll probably come back to it as well. But I, I also want to approach that idea of sanctioned things in public space from the perspective of, of graffiti and street art, which I'm doing a lot of research into. And with those those that there's a there's so many debates around graffiti and street art being sanctioned and unsanctioned. But the, mm. the, the direction I want to approach it from is from the perspective of the audience of, of Graffiti and Street Art. There's this huge, huge audience. Um, and it's this idea of using the city as a place of play. So for the audience, the city turned into a, a, a kind of map of play. And you know, there's this huge audience that go around photographing these things, putting online. The, the audience in a way become an artist themselves. And they, some of them even think of, them as, think of themselves as artists. So, th so there's this very, very big debate around unsanctioned, let's just say, art in public space, and then how the audience relates to that, and, and then that audience turning the city wherever they are into a kind of playground. And I think through, through that, we get to, we somehow will get to this debate about the statues coming down, because yeah. I see it's very related, um, and this kind of idea of mapping the city and, and, and how we navigate the city. Thank you, Sida. Susie. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's so much in there. I suppose in terms of the statues, I feel that um, the, the kind of analogy with the um, anatomy specimens in, in, in medical schools, you know, jars and jars of body parts which are there and they weren't given permission to be there by the by the people who has, have ended up in these jars and there's an ongoing debate about whether, whether they should be kept as a kind of memorial to those people or whether they should be brought down. And, and I suppose my personal feeling is we should definitely kind of recontextualize them and not give them that space. You know, so I would say bring them down. And if we want to remember our history, we have to really contextualize them in a very, um, um, intelligent way so they don't feel like abusive um, memories um, and traumatic memories for people and I would say plant trees public spaces get people to connect, connect with nature if they want a sense of ownership of their world to really remind people of a of a of the environment um, so that, that's one thing. In terms of agency, I work a lot in hospitals and often when working with healthcare professionals, they talk about having a lack of agency and it being a kind of systemic kind of problem that they can't get out of. So we talk about a lot about nonverbal and about the power of movement to create space. And you can see that whether you're around a bed of a loved one who is dying and how you move really changes that space or whether you're protesting on the streets for Black Lives Matter, that the power of movement um, is, is um, create, yeah, creates, creates space. So the more intelligent, I think, and articulate we can be about movement outside things like dance or sport or sex, you know, that we think about a kind of 
articulate, intelligent way. I think um, um, Henry Lefebvre talks about spatial competence. And in, in tra the training of healthcare professionals, in the training of, um, you know, at schools, people learn about physical education, but they don't learn about how to care through the way they use space. And, and I believe that the way we use space, nonverbals and spatial awareness are really the underpinning of what care is. And we see that now in the pandemic that people are finding social distancing so difficult. Mm. And people who've been to drama school or dance school don't have a problem with keeping a one and a half meters away because they kind of understand what space is in a very embodied way. Mm. And, and the work that I've done with David around with architects, how do they understand buildings through a physical experience of their own body rather than it being something outside of them? So yeah, um, spatial competence or verbal, uh, nonverbal kind of communication seems to me a very powerful way to give people a sense of agency, um, even if they're working within very oppressive systems. David. Right there, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, this question of the space in which one can formulate alternative futures. And um, in a way, I think there's always this question of what's the space in which that discussion's happening. And I mean, there is a kind of triangulation here between Gavin and Susie, who um, I've both been in discussion with over the last year about working in Birmingham and also teaching students. And it turns out that, you know, in a way, um, Eastside Projects, which is Gavin's um, space, has become the space in which we can think and we feel freer and um, our faculties are more present than if we're <laughs> in the city and in an office. Uh, you know, uh, I could, if I could describe the offices that are available to us to talk about the future of Birmingham, you'd want to be in Eastside Projects. And also, I think what was interesting was that, um, you know, Sonia's work was in the gallery whilst we were visiting with the students. And we'd done workshops with Susie around, um, you know, work, training workshops with architecture students around the body and how um, we kind of move between us. And then by implication, how we might better understand occupying public space. And we invited the students to, you know, through those workshops, put on performances that would be available to the public to visit at Eastside and then of course the work was all done around Sonia, Sonia's incredible installation uh, which you saw um, I think it's in, yeah it's surrounding Gavin right now <laughs> um, and I think there was this kind of wonderful moment of feeling like the work the space the conversation all might contribute to some um, future imagining of the city and somehow it you cannot think in those ways without those presences and without that environment and I think that's and I think that's also what was plainly clear is that has to be there from the outset I think the kind of history certainly the 20th century of um, architects involving artists it's this kind of late stage decoration um, which you know is bound to lead to missteps um, that would want one to tear things down it has to be from the outset uh, a kind of way of thinking. Uh, it's not a kind of art, I think particularly co the contemporary context of art practice, it's just not possible to place objects in space without some consideration of context. And therefore, you know, those conversations of context have to start right at the beginning. They are, they to do with briefs. I mean, you need um, artists' involvement throughout the project. Can I, can I follow? I, I just want to say that idea of having a say in, in your city, in a way for, for us, um, you know, collaborating on, this, on the Smithfield Market project in Birmingham, we've actually, we, we've approached it that we're, we're part of the public of, of Birmingham and we, we see that we have a role as artists and artist curators and that is, tech, that is actually pinpointed in the city's motto and its coat of arms that there's an artist and an, and an engineer on the coat of arms, supporters of Birmingham. So it's actually sanctioned that we are meant to support the city and how it changes. But I think in practice, over the last hundred years, that, that 
happens in you know starts and spurts and and is not is, is not like the way that David has described it is from the start and is setting the the agenda. So I think we're really excited about this project because it's such you know it's like a once in a lifetime opportunity to get to be part of rethinking what the market for such a big city should be, and and it becomes that role of opening that opening that up like who is it for and who has a voice in that and and who should it benefit and. For me, I think it needs to benefit all the people who want to be working in the market, who are working in the market at the moment, but also actually need to, need to think about what its voice is in, in changing Birmingham as a whole city. And, I, and for me, that just feels that's, that is what art should be about. It should be having the action to be part of improving everything about the structures around you. And, and, it, and it will put, put you in uncomfortable situations because of that. So we've got we've got a bit of a chance to have a go at doing that, and that's what you know. That's why we're sort of excited, and it, and it's based on the artists and the engineers collaborating to achieve it. So it's really a case of thinking very differently about the city and and what it is, what it is made of, what what the structures are that give it life. Um, um, I can see both Sonia and Elvira have got their hands up, and I also want to come back to Cedar again in a minute. Um, Sonia. Um, unmute. Um, two things thinking about. One, um, David mentioned quite early on this question about uh, the centre of the city and festivals. And then we kind of got more into a conversation about Venice and the Biennale. And um, I suppose I'm wanting to input here, and I, I, I don't quite know how it will work given what we've experienced this year, but the, the, the chance to meet is so important you know um you know one of the things that i uh, every time i go to venice to the biennale not just to the city outside of the biennale event but during the biennale event i see people that i've not seen for 20 years <laughs> there it happens every time i go or you know the, the question of being able to congregate in a particular way and i don't know what that will look like uh you know what that look like now far less in a, a few years time or into the future but you know there is a certain kind of joy it has to be said that comes from the opportunity to gather um mm. but i just wanted to i just wanted to add that in no and, and i think one of the you following what you were saying but also this idea of intervening in a space and having the opportunity to be both, um, you know, to have a role in, in, in processes, no, in decision-making processes is fundamental. But one of the things that I was thinking, just going back to the notion of, uh, of like well-being during the pandemic, no? like early on, I, I thought to myself, like very anecdotically, there's not going to be a concert around this. There's you know, not going to be a, a live a, a sort of like uh, sort of um, fundraising event global uh, at a global scale that will bring people together as we have seen in other moments in history where uh, disasters and health uh, issues have affected uh, large uh, um, uh, parts of the population. But all of the sudden George Floyd assassination and everything that contains that moment happens and people that were stuck in their houses all of a sudden decided that they needed to come together. They needed to feel their self among people, they needed to feel shelter among people. No? And I feel like the, the, this as a, I always seen, and this is not only me, but like many people that have analyzed riots in the 60s, 90s, right? LA, uh, then in London 20, 2011, there is a sense of both um, a constant discussion with a space that doesn't represent who you are, no? And I am thinking now what you were saying, say that about people, young people wanting to have them say through graffiti, through urban art, through the occupation of spaces, transforming them into, you know, um, um, I forgot the scooter, no, you know, skating areas, etc. right? Like there is something about ownership that, you, that we have been discussing from the beginning, right? And the capacity that we have as active citizens to claim that to our advantage, to imprint who we are in terms of uh, our bodies, as Susie was mentioning, not in terms of the, the multidisciplinarity. I mean, for me, 
the demonstration, as I say in the quote preceding this talk, no? this demonstration is an attempt to show our urbanness, what make us uh, citizens of this particular area of the world, but also, you know, every, everywhere else in the world to be there, to take appropriation of that, to challenge the homogenization of, of the spaces of the cities as we know it. And that has to do also about our mental health, you know, like maybe we are risking uh, our well-being because of COVID, but we need to raise our voice and scream to continue to feel that our humanness and that we have a sense of purpose beyond just to waiting for our sins to be repaired or waiting sort of like a decade of easiness of government restrictions, et cetera. No? Like I feel if the lockdown had done something incredibly powerful is to bring us back to the streets in a way that was Sonia was saying, no? at a global scale, no matter what was happening to you, no matter who you are, you are, you wanted to be raising your voice with others for things that couldn't remain silent. No? And I feel like this is also, uh, an attempt to transform the city in a way, or its public sphere. Ab absolutely, I think um, you're absolutely right that the um, that 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 lockdown has um, really taught us some 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 things that we have often overlooked um, aspects of ourselves and the communities that we live in and. Um, and, and, and making connections that weren't there before, um, even though they might not be physical face-to-face -face connections. Um, I mean, um, to, to bring Cedar in um, quickly, sorry, Mikolai, um, sure. just because um, we're talking about, you know, Gavin, is, Gavin and David and, and, and Susie are talking about this project they're working on in, in Birmingham about sort of, re-evaluating the city and um, it was it was making me think about um, the conversation that you and I had Cedar about record shops um, um, you know the cities you know obviously I'm a Londoner I love it it's it has so much going on in it but there are parts of it that are not necessarily visible to everybody, not necessarily mm. separated, but they perform a really huge social function. Um, and just to tell us a little bit about your dub project, because I mm. was also thinking about um, what the role of the senses are in the city. So- <clears throat> Yeah, well, actually, uh, um, yeah. Two, two points. Um, one, just to back up very quickly on something that Elvira just mentioned when she mentioned um, um, urban art and one of the best things because uh, I, I tend not to use the term and one of the best things that's come out of the, the Black Lives Matter movement you might have seen that lots of well, not, a, a couple of record labels have released statements saying they're no longer going to use the term urban music I think when that term I think the term urban when applied to art forms is is um I don't want to use the word, but pro problematic, um, you know, it, because it's basically can, can so often be a, a shorthand or a euphemism for black when people say urban music or urban art, it, not, so, not so much urban art, but vaguely. So there's so what for me, one of the best things that's happened is that lots of record labels have kind of stopped, you know, stopped denouncing that term. Also, um, I saw that one little Indian label are going to change their name just to uh, uh, I think they're, getting, they're, they're, they're changing their name. So there's all sorts of language things that are happening um, in terms of this debate around Black Lives Matter. But And that actually does quite relate to record shops directly as well. And it's true, I have been researching um, reggae record shops um, in London and the history of reggae record shops starting from Jamaica and how they um, kind of migrated to London. And that, and, and that is such an amazing and interesting history and leads to a kind of local histories which are not, not often told um, at a wider level. It's a very specialist kind of history, but it also is, is at one level it's very specialist, but at another level it's very mainstream and it affects, you know, if you, you watch an advert for a car or air freshener, they'll probably be using music that's that's been born somehow in those record shops or from that scene. So it is very, very mainstream, but also very, very specialist at the same time. But just in terms of, even if you want to be very, you know, um, distinct and, and just thinking of the kind of the architecture and the 
the the aesthetics of those record shops. They really are a very 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 unique uh, very unique environments. Um, that's really that's really quite amazing when you when you delve into it and the history in them. But it's it is it is it, they can be quite hidden in the city, and if you don't really know about them, particularly I'm I'm really and I'm you know there are record shops for all different genres, but I'm really looking at the the, the reggae record shops. And I know it's something that Sonia is quite interested in as well, and it leads to so many other things. It leads to sound system culture. Maybe we're going to talk about carnival later, and mm -hmm. and and all, and actually they're often they can be the heart of you know these political discussions that happen if you want to talk about. The riots in Brixton or or, or or Notting Hill Carnival when there have been riots there when I was a kid I remember them and and those record shops are often the places where you know conversations can happen and that you know pe people are free to speak um, that you know they're, they're real community zones and I think actually there's a lot that um, museums and galleries can learn from this these these spaces that um, such such as record shops and 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 when I've been going to these record shops and doing the research and I, I take my research with me and I, I get the computer out and I show people these historic images of other record shops and producers and stuff and the people in the shop and that's actually oftentimes I have to say it's a lot of times it's older Jamaican men you know it's, it's a really specific uh, demographic that you're talking to here and they're you know they're a demographic that would never go most of them have never been to a museum never go, hard would never a lot of people I'm speaking to in these record shops have never visited a museum which I think is really really sad but you know, that's, but there's something you know, there's something in that as well. But so I think, you know, it, maybe take the museum to them. I've had I've had amazing conversations when I show these historic photographs. They're so interested. They're so knowledgeable. They know so much about the history of the photographs that I'm showing them that we're trying to research on academic levels. And they are they just point the people out and they know them or they've had, you know, personal interactions with lots of these these images. So I think it's a very rich subject and. Um, it's been, yeah, it's been a fantastic honor to research it really, but yeah, that's it. Fabulous. What, what, what you describe, yeah, just, uh, you described basically this record shops as having a very strong social function. Yeah, that's quite interesting because uh, there's, it reminds me in Mark Bradford's um, uh, storytelling about uh, his barber shop that he created a community center out. And, you know, listening to him talking about this barber shop and about this other life he came from, where he was actually 40 years old before he became uh, successful as a uh, contemporary artist. And uh, this barbershop seems to you know, be a, as a source of his creativity, but going back there seems for him to be as important as the art that he's created and to provide for this barbershop and for this community center now also a social network for for other uh, uh, people to, to participate uh, is, is quite an interesting thing. And we have a kind of, from, from our feeling, we have two, two layers on, on every city. We have a layer that is quite uh, social alienated, uh, where you don't really, you know, big corporates, Starbucks, whatever. And then you have on the other hand, this kind of functions that can really provide um, more than just a barbershop or just a record shop, but also a, a social hub. And I think what you are saying is absolutely true and right that uh, museums should go into these directions and uh, more of the spaces needs to be created. So the city is really um, a kind of um, environment for humans and not an environment for, for goods and services to be exchanged. That's, I think, um, um, for us, obviously, the human body is a very important uh, part of it. And, uh, um, we see now, uh, you know, brands like Dior going local also. Uh, I think this is a trend. And actually, Sonia, what you described with Venice is quite interesting because Venice obviously is also a um, local uh, thing because the community, the art community is very international. But when you meet in one place, it's also like the street outside. You know, sometimes it's even better known than the street outside. So um, that's maybe a little bit going into this direction. Um, and of the question from the beginning, how this kind of practice, like Gavin, you, you, you described, and uh, I learned now a lot about your center, uh, can be implemented more strongly in society, because I think that would be uh, a really great outcome uh, that would immediately have healthcare effects in our, um, in our view, um, because I think the more the people can participate, the more happy and healthy um, uh, they are, and the more they feel that they really own. This is exactly what you said, Elvira, they, they, when they have ownership over there. Because our body, this is what we learned with COVID-19, is not stopping here. 
it actually connected on a bacterial level with all the other bodies and it's all the time communicating with the air that we're breathing in and out, uh, connecting us to everybody else in the room. And uh, if we cannot own our environment, it's like not owning our body. It's somehow very much connected with each other. I think also this uh, extremely important debate that, that Sonia, you participated uh, through the state project um, and taking down this picture, is now also a part of a global um, uh, debate that is happening. It's also a part of uh, redefining basically your own body that is a social uh, body, a social structure. And that that actually is uh, like our, we are now working with Stefano Mancuso, you may know him um, as a biologist uh, on a manifesto, manifesto for cities actually, but it's not a manifesto that will be, you know, um, uh, formulated by one uh, entity, but we want to collect as many uh, sentences, as many voices, as many ideas for it. And this is a question that, that I would like to yeah, put into this virtual room. Uh, what would you take on a manifesto for a better city? What would you like to add to a city or maybe highlight what is already working well? And if you could uh, give us such an idea, that would be for us extremely um extremely enlightening uh, and i yeah, would be extremely interested to know what, what what is the main point that you would like to focus us in the next you know decade to change david yeah so. no i was just interested in um cedar's shops and kind of recognizing that um that this is a very granular type of city it's small spaces that are often the, the possibility of leasing it is to do with an affordable um, you know, certain dimension. And I think a lot of regeneration is kind of blind to some of the existing urban fabric in which all of these possible social spaces are only made, um, uh, it can only function because of the, the kind of layers of ownership and the, the, the structure of the, the built environment. And I think as I, I can often use this kind of comic and tragic city scape, um, which are these kind of theatre sets that would drop in Renaissance theatres. And um, the tragic is all very big, symmetrical, palatial architecture that's made for a certain kind of civic performance. And the comic is this kind of higgledy piggledy, fine grain, um, kind of uh, heterogeneous world. And in a way, that's the world that's often already there and goes overlooked. And it's the world in which chance things happen. And um, somehow I think being always aware of what's already there, which I think is a kind of consistent theme actually, is crucial to making a better city because a lot of it, and it, particularly in terms of the energy you need to put in, a lot of the energy to make a great city is already in the city. It's just about recognizing it and, de and deploying it effectively. Um, I think the kind of, um, a lot of regeneration um, is, is about a kind of can we kind of make better as a kind of new but it's a lot a, a lot of benefit you know where are these record shops and how do we uh, map them and know where they are and that they're part of tomorrow's I think I just cut in David I think it's two things I think you're right it's there, there's the kind of architectural uh, scale of those stores um, but actually the, the equally important is the people behind the counter It's the stories and the conversations you have with people um, that's also so interesting the history that they can tell you about you know the records that you buy and that so often leads into a conversation about the area or about politics or about food you know so there's it's the human interaction is uh, I would say really as important yeah. as the um the architectural space they kind of go hand in hand and it yep. is it is something that yeah it's 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 just so at risk i think um so it's something that i think people that are when they are planning these you know future cities that it's, it's something that you don't want to lose and the record shops is just one example there are there are think, other examples as well hairdressers etc but yeah yeah that's a really good um point cedar because it's it's about spaces being able to be where people can tell stories um, and those stories belong to that area and they can only be found in that location. Um, 
uttered by that person who's addressing you and yeah so I think what 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 um I mean Mikolai you want you want to to you want the the your manifesto um from from the from the panel but I suppose before before we do that could we just very quickly um I mean I suppose what it is is um I would like it also if you could just briefly somebody address the whole question of what can artists and architects and designers do to make this sort of change happen um, that we're, we're sort of feeling our way towards? Um, can, I, can I just simply ask this in reverse? Because what, yes. what Frida was saying in terms of the local record store and what, for instance, the showroom has been doing for over 10 years through the communal knowledge program is to listen to the neighborhood, to listen to the people that is in the neighborhood, to try to engage with sort of like the health worker that you mentioned, Susie, with programs that we had done with local hospital in this Charles Street area. There is something about those local histories and about all the citizens to be at the forefront of that questioning together with both architects and artists, right? I feel like if we, oh, yes. if we keep, sort of like keeping, delegating, let's say, that sort of power of being an active representative of our own communities, of our histories, of our stories, right? Mm -hmm. We lose the chance to also see ourselves reflected in the city that is going to, mm -hmm. is yet to come, right? So I feel like a larger conversation in which there is a, a more horizontal space where they, 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 mm -hmm. as professionals, um, our professional, our, individuals, members of the audience, and people that, as said, I was saying that perhaps never entered into the museum has a say in how we want both the spaces in the museum, both the Biennales, both places like Venice, but also our own cities, our own uh, spaces to be transformed would be great. Yes. So, I, I totally agree um, with what Elvira said. It feels to me that it's about inviting people, whatever space that you're in, inviting other people into that space who don't, who aren't usually there. So that we, uh, so this kind of interdisciplinarity, whether that's you know across you know artists and architects, or it's about different um, people in shops or hairdressers, that we just try to move around spaces, do things in different types of spaces. I mean, there's great kind of um you know in a lot of art galleries there's like nail there's been like nail salon kind of art projects i think those kind of social spaces resituating them you know in all different configurations really helps break down those boundaries and makes people understand the conditions people are living and working in so these spaces back to what sonia says about where we can gather you know there's so few spaces where are the community halls you know the rehearsal spaces it's so diff difficult even to gather as a, a performance company without having to pay hundreds or thousands of pounds for a large space to gather in i think big public spaces both indoor and out outdoor really need to be built into you know the planning of buildings so that lots of different people can be invited to gather there and to understand what life is like because there's such a big gap um, so many different kinds of gaps somebody mentioned on the chat like bankers you know <laughs> all these different communities that are in the city you know um, need to um, dialogue and have some understanding so they can support each other just to point out yeah there's an interesting comment that's just come in the chat I'm just reading it about you know kind of uh, the art world it, just to sum it up it looks like they're saying the art world basically co-ops these spaces so often and I, and I do tend to agree that you know that's a problem that you know it isn't for the art world to go out there and co-opt these spaces but the, what you want to do is help keep these spaces going and help help them survive um you know that's the important thing and you know they're they're part of the that you know they're part of they should be I think museums and galleries need to be part of the communities that they're in and yeah they don't need to eat up their neighbors for sure <laughs> This, um, I think it, it, it's very much, like even the word ownership for me is, is, an, is an issue that I think artists and architects and designers can, can deal with, that I think it, it is very much about what you do in what we call public space. Who are you serving 
the majority of the time, we're actually serving private interests. So I think it, 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 we can think about how we occupy, occupy space, not through ownership, but through stewardship. And I'm sure that word can be misused in all sorts of ways, but I've been, I've been listening to these lectures that Belfast University are doing on the post-pandemic city and approaches to it through health and social justice and planning uh, rules. And the last talk, they were talking about informal cities and informal ways of um, actually the, the horror of having to have a formal city, which is all owned and where the money is. And then this informal cities all, all around the world, of course, mm -hmm. where there's no planning at all. And just to, tr and to, to ignore that and to treat it like it just happens is again and again the crime that governments do all around the world. They just let it carry on. So, so this was a planner trying to say, we should be looking at what works in informal cities. And there's loads of brilliant things that do work and mm -hmm. anticipate those and help that and support that and think about not having to own it. But within that community, they one of the phrases that he would use is that they would need to place stewards and, and they were often community centers or galleries or libraries or places but they they have to be given the instructions that you have to you, you need to protect this bit of green here so that in 20 years time we can release it back out and so there is a pocket of green within this huge informal area that happens so it's just looking forward and that comes from from design thinking and planning thinking and then if you look at the lecture um one of the Civic Square lectures in Birmingham over the weekend was with um, Alistair Parvin, and it's an incredible text. Like every single person watching this should look it up and read it. And it explains about land ownership in the UK. And I think we all know a bit about it. We sort of have the inkling of what it is, but even he just describes in detail the phrase landlord and why, why it's called a landlord and how that goes back to the, the formation of the idea of ownership of land in this country. So until that's removed, nothing, nothing will completely change. We will only be existing in the system that is designed to just to oppress and get people ready to go to, go to war, basically. So it, 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 like we do all have a role to, to talk about the alternative systems and structures and to, to sell it, to show the world how it can be great and how you can be part of it. And, and also just to look out for those people who are coming up with great ideas to adopt them ourselves, use them and share them as we go along. I think that that is an ongoing important role for all of us. I think it's quite interesting how festivals became in the recent years and kind of alternative cities. So everybody was basically escaping the city to live at festivals and the festivals became somehow more real because more engaging the creativity of the, the people going there in the cities itself as a kind of alternative universe to the city. As you cannot express yourself in the city, you go to the festival and festivals you now reach like hundred thousands of people attendance, uh, creating own cities like Burning Man is an example of something that I know that a lot of people in culture are very hesitant uh, uh, to look into, but, uh, but actually if, if you are going there, you, you can see how you, you, you said it, David, that there's this potential already in the city. And if you look at Burning Man, you can see what happens when people are completely free to express themselves uh, without boundaries, actually, or almost without boundaries. Then uh, the, the, the amount of creativity is incredible. And I somehow, um, uh, I, I also agree with you, Gavin, that there's uh, suppressive structures uh, that are suppressing this creativity. And actually, uh, people instead of maybe ownership is the wrong word, but uh, word, but in, in, instead of being engaged and being able to transform something that they find into something else, they basically uh, use their own personal energy into um, purchasing stuff. So into basically buying something that was already presented or prepared for them um, to, uh, to be consumed. And this is, I think, also from a mental health perspective, extremely dangerous because uh, people are not uh, no, uh, fulfilled for this consume only for one moment maybe, but then, then uh, it ends. And when they create uh, something from, you know, from the beginning as a project together with other people, I like very much uh, Sonia your quote about cooperation. This is, I think, something that is also starting now in the art world to happen, to do something with other people, with, you know, not 
not to maybe uh, to support what you said, Kevin, not to own it completely, but to share the ownership. Uh, also, this is a mega trend uh, internationally, now also implemented in our economic system, the shared economy, uh, where I see a big chance to, you know, to share an experience of creating something with other people. Yeah. Sonia, what would be your uh, sentence for a uh, for a better city, or what would be your um, idea to to highlight, um, to implement, or to? Oh wait, you you are muted. I, we want you don't want to miss that. I, I would say that I don't know, and mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm allowed to say I don't know. Um, you know, I, I was looking at some of the comments and. In a way, there is a kind of mirage, I might say, that somehow those of us in the, in the art field have a knowing. We have an answer, and I uh, and I think we we really need to fess up to feeling our way through things, and not necessarily having the answer to something. Uh, I'm just looking at a particular. Uh, question here about that we're there to make something better and for whom and who says that it's better and um, from what perspective is it better and it's you know I have to admit I'm starting from myself and what I want to see as better in co in conversation with others and hopefully coming to an agreement about what but not always coming to an agreement so I'm not going to suggest that I have an answer Mm -hmm. uh, I have a I have a desire to see things that I think are, are working very badly work differently, allow much more um, possibility to express for people to express something than I see existing at this moment. But I can't say that I have an answer because that would for me that would yeah I'm not sure I, it doesn't sit within my head very well that. It's definitely now on the list of my very favorite answers. I don't know. That's really, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously it's a very, very intelligent answer and very true. Yeah, we can't know. But we can try. We, get, we have to try, but we can't know. That's totally true. Yeah. Uncertainty is a great uh, organizing principle, let's say. Absolutely <laughs> true, yeah. This is actually something that also uh, Sumaya from Counterspace said uh, regarding, and Frida Escobedo also, regarding space in the city that we are basically tending to always assign a function always define yeah instead of leaving the ambiguity so the things can happen you know um and that's actually also uh, a very beautiful um exactly what you said Elura. actually I, I don't know it's a perfect uh, perfect uh, answer to wrap up this uh, <laughs> this conversation <laughs> I'm Emma. sorry I'm sorry <laughs> no it's really I mean it's really amazing uh, especially as we run out of time and uh, you know this topic can be uh, you know continued into the into eternity and it will be uh, for sure but um, for me it already contains so many different uh, thoughts and points of views uh, I'm fulfilled right now. <laughs> thank you, um, Mekalai, um, and um, thank you very much, Terme Art, and thank you so much to all of you um, as panelists. You've all been incredibly generous with your thoughts and ideas, and um, this is a topic that that um, will return um, again and again. I'm sure in the coming weeks and months. Um, and, but I've really, really appreciated the, um, the honesty um, and, and yeah, um, power that you have brought from your own personal practice to um, this conversation. Um, it's been very special. So thank you um, and see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you to everybody. Thanks everyone for listening. Great. Thanks. I really enjoyed Bye. that. Great to see you. Uh -huh.